Our final video for chapter one, which covers section 1.6, mathematical treatment of measurement results, is all about learning to use dimensional analysis. And if there is one thing that I could recommend you start doing now and continue to use throughout this semester and however long you take chemistry, this would be it. Learn to use dimensional analysis because it will save you from so many mistakes. I, I have a doctorate, I still use dimensional analysis because it's a foolproof method to get the results you're looking for when you're doing any sort of mathematical function. Yep. So where is dimensional analysis useful? It's called dimensional analysis in your textbook. It's also called the factor label method some other places. So maybe you picked it up there. Yep. This is when we are trying to find something where we can't measure it directly and rather we have to do a calculation. And we have to take into account the numbers that we were using, the units that were associated with those numbers, and any uncertainty, right? The significant figures. That all gets tied in to this process known as dimensional analysis. Okay? Now we've got this definition at the top. Okay? Units of quantities must be subjected to the same mathematical operations as their associated numbers. All I recommend to do to simplify it even further right, is what I have on the bottom. Think about fractions. Okay? If you have a fraction 3 over 3, it cancels out to 1. And anything multiplied by 1 is itself, so it doesn't change the calculation. Units will do the same thing in those fractions. So if I've got a unit, say, milliliters on top and the bottom, milliliters over milliliters, just like 3 over 3 or 2 over 2, Right? It cancels out and it's one. And then it no longer affects the rest of the function because anything multiplied or divided by one is right? not going to change that mathematical answer. So that's a really important concept to grasp now. Okay? And it's going to pay dividends later on. Practice, practice, practice dimensional analysis. Right? If you come to me with a math question and I ask to see your work, that's going to be the first thing that I'm looking for. So let's see an example. If we could use an exact conversion here, okay, known as a conversion factor or a unit conversion, okay, ratio of two things just with different units. So I know it was covered in one of the earlier videos that one inch is exactly equal to 2.54 centimeters. So even though they're different numbers in different units, this is still just one, right? It's just a way to convert the units. Okay, so 2.54 centimeters over one inch, it's the same number. Okay, so we're gonna change it to different units, but the answer is still gonna be the same, if you will, right? If it's this long to start with, it's gonna be this long to finish. I'm just changing the answer from inches to centimeters or centimeters back to inches. Okay? So those are called conversion factors, things that are equivalent to one another that are used to change the units. Here's some examples of other ones. Right? Don't worry, this is a lot to try and grasp all at once, right? If you need these conversion factors, they would be given to you, right? Unless it's a metric prefix, for example. I will ask you to convert, for example, from grams to kilograms or from centimeters to meters. You have to know how to do that on your own. That would not be given to you. But something like one liter is equal to 1.0567 quarts, that would be given to you if you needed it. So getting into using dimensional analysis, what it looks like is on the next slide. Uh, this is kind of what I've been explaining verbally already. When I multiply a quantity by a unit conversion factor, I'm converting the quantity to an equivalent value that now has different units, okay? but it's still equal, just a different way of saying it, right? It's like giving your height in inches and your height in meters. That right? could be different ways to represent it. Okay? But anything I do to a number, I do to the unit. I treat them the same way. Numbers and units are treated the same way. So what does that look like? Okay. Let's say I'm tasked with converting 34 inches to centimeters. So I start with the number 34 inches. Okay. And then I use this conversion factor over here. Multiply it by 2.54 centimeters over one inch. So now inches is on the top over here. You could think about this number being over one 
if it's easier to, for you. Right? Inches is on the top, inches is on the bottom, right? Or you can think about it as being in the numerator and the denominator. So that's why this red line is here. Inches canceled out. So all I do now is take 34, multiply it by 2.54, okay? Get a final answer of 86 centimeters, okay? Because that's the only unit that's left over. So that must be the unit that gets reported. Okay? And the reason that this is reported as 86 is because this number had two sig figs, this number had three, and the rule for multiplication is that your final answer should have as many significant figures as whatever had the fewest, two in this case. I already mentioned it here, I'll practice it again. Practice, 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 practice problems like this on your own. It will be beneficial to you, particularly if you're pursuing more work in STEM. All right. Now, a problem like that, it's not the most useful thing in the world, right? But dimensional analysis is incredibly useful for multi-step problems. Because if we take 1.9 from your textbook, it asks for the density of antifreeze in grams per milliliter, giving you information about quarts and pounds, which isn't very useful. So you can try working this one on your own, right? Use dimensional analysis. You'll first have to take the quarts and convert it to liters, and then the liters and convert it to milliliters, and the pounds convert it to grams. But if you use dimensional analysis, you can do that all in one step, making sure that your units cancel out. Or if you prefer to do it in individual steps, that's fine too. So I recommend you pause this video, try that. You should get a final answer of 1.11 grams per milliliter. Yep. And that's something we can go over in the review session as well. We finish 1.6 talking about temperature, which we already introduced in an earlier video, right, when we talked about Kelvin. But you also need to know how to convert between Celsius and Fahrenheit. Right? We already talked about the definitions of the Celsius scale. Fahrenheit, right, 32 where water freezes, water boils is 212, right, different scales. Okay? So it's not as easy of a conversion, not a direct multiplication. Right? How do we convert those two? We already talked about Kelvin as well. All right, here are your formulas. If you're relating Celsius and Fahrenheit, you've got this formula right here. Notice it's not a direct multiplication because you've got that addition over there. Right. This is a key one. You do have to know how to convert from Celsius to Kelvin. We'll do it all the time, but it's an easy one. All you do to convert from degree Celsius to Kelvin is add 273.15. And you do need to get accustomed to the Kelvin scale. All three of them are represented on this final slide from chapter one. So from this video, know those two formulas we just saw for converting temperature, but absolutely 100% get used to working with dimensional analysis. It'll be one of the easiest ways to make sure you don't make any mathematical mistakes and you set yourself up for success in this course.